let's say something nice about the Oakland Athletics first. You go first. <laughs> oh, man. I feel like you did that on purpose. Yeah, okay. I did. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Look, I say this as a Bay Area native who spent most uh-huh. of her childhood going to Coliseum games because it was way cheaper than going to what was then AT&T Park. Um, what I like about the A's, I think Tony Kemp is a great leader. <laughs> yeah, um, he's a really nice guy. No, there, there's that. I mean, it's a rough time to be an Oakland A's fan. I get it. Whether you're looking at the roster projection, the starting lineup projection, or the projection of where the team could end up regarding this geographical location. There's just mm. not really a lot to be excited about. Something the A's, I mean, even when you look at their their farm system, it's it's ranked pretty low. Um, I don't know, maybe Ramon Laureano can have a really stellar first half and they trade him for <laughs> some, them some more prospects. Oh, you know, look... <laughs> One of the games that we like to play in spring, the St. Louis Scribes and I, mm. is we look at the Cardinals on the backfields and the various live BPs going on, and we say to ourselves, where would that guy pitch if he was in Oakland A? Like, what number starter would be as he's no. fighting to break camp, <laughs> if he's fighting, like, just fighting to break the rotation, where would he be? And I think the Cardinals have two or three players alone on this on their spring training, in, in the spring training backfields, that would be at least a two or three for the current Oakland oh. A's rotation. I'm going to push back a little bit. Okay, let's, let's, let's bit. debate. The, the, uh, the, and I'm not going to go to my model numbers or anything like that. I'm actually going to just point out that I think that they have starting pitcher depth. Okay. I, I, so you're you're you this is why it's only pushing out a little bit. You might be right about the relative quality and they could slot in. However, I think the the A's have at least amassed like seven or eight number threes and number fours in a rotation. I would agree with that. Uh, So they have a lot of guys. And if I want to like if I want to be more positive, I do actually think uh, Shintaro Fujinami. There's I think there's something about his game that could translate better to the American game in that. He's a high stuff, low command guy. And we are, we're pretty comfortable with that in America. And like, I think that that we like in terms of coaching and getting the most out of him there, we might be able to, to help Shintaro Pujanami be maybe a little bit better than people expect. Um, And anyone, anyone who's like throws 99 with a devastating splitter, like I'm going to say has, has decent upside. And the other guy, Ken Waldachuk, I think has three really good pitches has top of the rotation rotation upside. So those are my two guys that I think, you know, on talent alone uh, would slot in at one and two. Uh, but then, yeah, guys like uh, Blackburn, Caprellian, uh, I think even Muller, Sears, um, you know, Martinez, um, you know, I think a lot of those guys are, uh, are depth in a way that they are set up uh, to, to have depth and then also maybe provide depth to other teams i mean you're right you 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 think oh well paul blackburn had a pretty good season where's he going um and that's that's the real sad truth about uh being in oakland for me it's uh it's a bizarre feeling you know we're talking about spring and um you know walking into these clubhouses i think for you, you there must be a real sense of continuity from season to season i mean especially with guys like adam wainwright you maybe you've lost a little bit of that with yadi or not being there this year but uh, you know, there's the same people every year and you get to build these, these relationships. Um, uh, I feel like, uh, you know, walking into the A's clubhouse is a lesson in speed dating. I have to, right. uh, get to know them very quickly, uh, and they'll be gone very quickly. So. Exactly. No. And, and that's, uh, that's really hard when you're, when you're a fan too. How do you build yeah. these connections with these players and this organization when it's like a constant revolving door, you walk into the Cardinals clubhouse and, I mean, their 2023 team is almost identical to their 2022 team, which is very similar to their 2021 team. Um, I I want to be positive for Oakland. I think Oakland A's fans are some of the most passionate and interesting fans in baseball. They're incredibly loyal, but it just looks like being positive, overwhelmingly positive about the A's seems so far off on the horizon right now. I don't see that changing in 2023 or 2024. Yeah, and it's uh, it's interesting to to wonder just um, 
you know, if some of the if some of the innovations around the rest of baseball just haven't, you know, haven't taken hold if the A's are falling behind a little bit there. I know that they are trying to reorganize some of the um, interaction between technology and player development. Um, that's some place that I think they've fallen pretty far behind. Um, and I know that um, they also just see things a little differently. I mean, I think the Asturi Ruiz uh, trade was a, a fascinating look into how different front offices uh, can value the same player very differently. I mean, it's pretty obvious that different front offices evaluate Ruiz differently because he's been traded like three times, you know? Mm -hmm. So that already says some organizations thought this is a good enough guy to trade. And another organization thought we'll take him on and then thought mm, we should trade him. So, uh, you know, to have that be the centerpiece for the Sean Murphy trade, uh, a, a guy who's been off to, like, you know, three times traded, that's that's already weird. Um, and then you have this asterisk that he just doesn't hit the ball hard by like our, our stat cast metrics in terms of hard hit rate. He was, he was, um, a laggard in the, in the minor leagues and his, uh, maybe a lot of his, his power numbers come from, uh, his legs, uh, cause he's very fast. However, at the same time, we're heading into a new, uh, a new league with, with regards to stealing bases and the rules about throwing over and everything. Um, if there is somebody that could steal 80 bases next year and be allowed to take off as much as he wants, because maybe the team isn't that great. Um, I think Ruiz could be uh, an easy guy to, uh, to lead the league in steals. I don't know if he'll have a 300 OBP. I don't know if he'll have a 400 slugging. Um, I don't know if he's a star uh, the way that uh, maybe the, the A's front office thinks, uh, but I do think um he's going to be maybe the most fascinating person to watch on the A's this year. Is there, is there anybody else you're, you're keeping your eye on uh, in this, on this roster that, uh, that could be interesting? You know, I didn't really, well, one, I do agree that fascinating is a good word for the Ruiz trade because I love the trade for the Braves. I love the trade for the Brewers and I wasn't, <laughs> that intrigued. can't be good. You can't love the trade for three teams. <laughs> I was really intrigued. Uh, the intrigued with the last part. Yeah. Um, but when I'm looking at the A's, I'm thinking about a trade they just did when they traded AJ Puck to the Marlins for JJ Blade. And to me, I don't think that trade re like really moves the needle for either team. But I'm wondering what they saw in Blade, who didn't really have a clear cut spot with the Marlins to trade Puck, maybe because it comes back to what you mentioned with the starting pitching depth. I mean, AJ Puck was once a top valued prospect. Now he's reunited in Miami with another former A's top prospect in Jesus Lazardo. Um, for me, I'm wondering what they think and what they saw in JJ Blade where they think he can be successful. If they saw something metrics wise, if they saw something in the data where they were comfortable giving away someone who was at one point relatively prized in the organization to take someone that it didn't seem like the, the Marlins really valued or had a place for. Yeah, and I think that the through line between both of these is a reliance on actual results um, in the minor leagues versus other teams valuing process in the minor leagues more. Uh, and the way I can explain this is if you look at what Lede did at AAA last year and you say, okay, he was 23% better than league average in AAA as a 24-year-old. Uh, he walked 16% of the time. He struck out 27% of the time. He slugged 470. These, if you group him with other players that did these things in the minor leagues, they are successful X percent of the time. Puck is a reliever for us. You know, that selling a reliever to get an X percent chance at a credible major leaguer based on his AAA stats is something we believe in. That, I think, makes a lot of sense if you think about the way the A's work. Sure. They do. They get a lot of guys out of triple A triple A numbers do translate better to the majors than double A or high A. They don't bother with high A. There was a trade Luis Castillo uh, for like two, 16, 17, you know, they, mm -hmm. they got that guys like, you know, they got Noel V Marte, you know, who's like uh, in high A, you know, the A's could have done a trade like that. Instead, they traded for, you know, Shea Langoliers and, you know, guys that are, have higher floors and are higher, uh, you know, are closer to the major leagues and are more projectable, you would call it. Um, but uh, the same thing you could look at Bidet the same way you look at Ruiz and say, you know, the hardest hit ball he hit this year was 107.9. That's below average. If you look at his barrel rate, it was, it, it was okay, but it wasn't good for a slugger. Um, so, 
you know, we have some process numbers and they have those process numbers for the minor leagues where they can say they can look at their exit velocities minor leagues. We can't. But what I'm guessing is he's overproduces his, his exit velocities and they think, no, he's got something figured out. He knows how to he knows how to hit and he's projectable and, and he's worth that chance. So, I mean, it's, it's I think it was a, it's a look into what they're doing. I mean, one thing that I do like about what they've done so far is getting somebody like Shea Langoliers back in the in one of their trades as a as a future uh, linchpin up the middle i think he's very smart and he's going to be a very good catcher um and and i do like actually acquiring all this starting pitcher depth because i do think that especially on uh trade deadline day what is the number one thing that people seem to want it's starting pitching. pitching i mean you yeah. can find anything that you want at the trade deadline except starting pitching. It has consistently been the highest valued position. The market is always favoring the sellers at the trade deadline regardless, because at that point, teams that are willing to trade are usually desperate to win. And mm -hmm. we've seen the demand for starting pitchers at the trade deadline. I mean, look, thinking back to 2022, when the Cardinals traded for Jordan Montgomery and Jose Quintana, that elevated their season. Um, yeah. And but, you know, it's not like it came without a cost. A starting exactly. center fielder in the, in the major leagues is a gold you know, lover. Right. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And then I, I think of like the, you know, uh, the, the Yankees trying, uh, to get A's pitchers, you know, two, two years out of four or whatever, mm -hmm. giving up some, some assets, I mean, none that have really moved the needle yet. Although I do like Waldachuk, um, and, and the Yankees getting almost nothing for it with the news with Frankie Montas's shoulder and, uh, Sonny Gray just having just a terrible time there. So, um, yeah, I think the A's have set themselves up to to be sellers in terms of uh, starting pitching. That's that's a decent thing. But they're just uh, to me, uh, they're just very bad offensively up the middle. Mm -hmm. um, and to some extent, that includes Langley's got some things he can do, and Ruiz does too. But like, especially on the infield, I don't I don't see uh, a solution coming. I don't see a shortstop of the future on this roster. Um, especially now with the shift rules, I, I, I think they're going to have to play Kemp. I don't think they can play Jordan Diaz or any of the other guys over there. They, they've been trying to hide some, you know, kind of almost first baseman at second base uh, in the past. And I don't think they can do that anymore with the shift rules. So uh, I just don't see an up, uh, the infield coming together, really. Um, and that's where I would start building myself. I feel like outfielder is a little bit easier to find. And I would want to have building blocks on the infield. Agreed. So I, I would old. agree. Even with Nick Allen, I'm still not. He's a good defensive guy. Yeah, I'm still not overly positive about. Well, really, a lot of the A's, but the middle infield. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, the sad news is, brass taxes. They project as uh, the worst team in the American League, um, and uh, above average, really comfortably above average, uh, only at Ramon, Ramon Laureano and Shea Langelier's positions. Um, so that's two places that uh, they can maybe build upon in the future. But I, I, I know Ramon wouldn't mind uh, being traded out. So <laughs> <laughs> I asked him about it last year. I, asked, I said something. I said something vague, like, "Man, there's nobody here," you know. And I think I meant in the clubhouse because it was like after the trade right. deadline. And he took it to mean nobody in the stands. And his response was classic. It was great. Yes, I've taken up coffee. Oh, <laughs> not what you want. That is not what you want to hear. He said, I'm getting really into coffee. And he showed his coffee maker, his espresso maker he takes on the road. And like, yikes. <laughs> that should okay. be the slogan for the A's. Bring your coffee <laughs> to the Coliseum. <laughs> oh, man.